added fairness where apart from uh, preserving customer satisfaction you also try to give equal exposure to the sellers or producers suppose some sellers so whenever you are searching with battery if it is such that the marketplace is only you know recommending some sellers or putting up results from such from certain sellers while it is uh, like uh, uh, not showing results for certain other sellers then that's not a very fair treatment okay so uh, the marketplace in that sense is not fair so if you want to preserve the uh, visibility or the exposure that a seller gets then the marketplace has to design fair recommendation algorithms so then the next question that comes is that are we still missing something so seems like there is one more key thing that we are missing so why is the marketplace in itself important you see marketplace are organizations like amazon flipkart etc walmart etc right so these are big marketplaces so now the point here the, the 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 biggest point of contention here is that marketplace itself is also in the competition okay so basically amazon itself has started producing its own products like amazon basics amazon brand uh, solimo etc also amazon has this fulfillment services so i guess anybody who have purchased from amazon have seen this uh, important tag like fulfilled by amazon so this means these are products that are actually the entire delivery is maintained by amazon itself so therefore you see if now the entire marketplace uh, runner is also a person who is or is also like impersonating as a seller so this is where the problem comes in and this is what justifies the title of my talk so if the umpire itself if umpire himself becomes you know a part of the game and starts playing then that that's not a very good thing so this is what is exactly happening in the uh, various marketplaces so this is not only in amazon this is also true in flipkart this is also true in walmart and all other such uh, big marketplaces so if the marketplace that are that is supposed to you know host different sellers and attract customers to those sellers are themselves also playing as sellers so therefore there will be a natural tangent tendency of the marketplace to promote it promote its own products right so this is a very intuitive thing that anybody can think of and the question is like can one quantitatively you know study whether this is happening or not and that is what actually lays the foundation of our current research so as i said amazon itself the marketplace itself is in direct competition with other third party sellers and manufacturing brands on the platform okay so uh, before going into a uh, little more details of the uh, analysis that we have done let us try to understand the marketplace and the different relationships of the entities on this on this marketplace on an e-commerce uh, platform so there is the marketplace which is amazon itself okay there are products there are sellers and there are customers so the entities are sellers who sells different products and then there is the other side of the coin which are the customers and the marketplace is kind of the is supposed to be the host of the host for the sellers for the customers and the products that the sellers sell now the for the amazon in specific there can be two types of customers as i guess all of you are aware you it can be a prime customer or a non prime customer sellers could be you know fulfilled by amazon or amazon affiliates so these are also uh, sellers uh, which are 
you know like subsidiaries of amazon like cloud ten uh, india or apario india these are both subsidiaries of amazon or fulfilled by the merchant that is this these people are those who are not using the amazon services for delivery but using their own specific services for delivery while on the product side it could be a private label product like the uh, products that i have just now introduced like amazon basics amazon solimo etc and third party products so these are products from other sellers so this is more or less in a nutshell the structure of the marketplace now Uh, there has been a lot of fairness concerns about the amazon marketplace so as i just now said that amazon is in direct contention with the other sellers on the platform because amazon itself apart from being uh, the marketplace also uh, acting as a seller in itself and therefore there are lot of allegations that already has come up in various news articles like these are some of the examples like amazon charged algorithm uh, sorry changed algorithms in ways that boost its own products so this is something like you know that is that uh, i was uh, trying to uh, narrate a few slides back that there will be a natural intention to steer their own products then amazon is replacing product suggestions with ads and etc etc so there are lots and lots of um um uh, such allegations and in fact the government itself uh, in different countries have uh, become uh, serious about it and uh, in the us uh, there was a antitrust subcommittee um, which conducted a hearing hearing of the um, uh, uh, different uh, issues uh, raised against the amazon marketplace uh, so uh, if you just type in google uh, antitrust subcommittee hearings in the usa amazon responses uh, you will see a bunch of responses that the uh, uh, internal amazon representative have uh, put forward to the subcommittee and you will see that many of these you know answers are particularly hazy so there is no quantification that has been done many of these answers are like Uh, very very uh, hazy and superficial the same thing same exercise has also been done by uh, india in early 2019 and uh, if you look at the fdi policies of the government of india you will see that amazon and flipkart has been warned about certain different um, allegations that have been brought against them by different sellers so in this work we will try to do a little bit of quantification of this particular these of these kind of allegations whether these allegations are really uh, there whether amazon is really making some um, uh, discrimination uh, among these sellers and things like that so these are all as i said anecdotal uh, evidences raising questions or concerns uh, however they do not you know give succinct quantitative answers and the search that we are trying to make in this particular study is to uh, bring forth certain quantitative justifications of whatever concerns that have been raised so far so in a nutshell we perform a systematic study of the sponsored recommendations on amazon uh, we propose quantification of Uh, relative bias and uh, uh, like we try to compare the organic recommendations with the sponsored recommendation so sponsored recommendations let me clarify uh, here once and for all so sponsored recommendations are recommendations which are paid so there are uh, sellers who pay amazon specifically for sponsoring their uh, items okay and showing their results uh, at the top and the organic recommendations are the recommendations that appear due to the natural behavioral history of a user okay so this is the difference so uh, the while the sponsored recommendations are mostly paid 
the organic recommendations are uh, mostly uh, generated uh, based on user behavior. So, and we will try to see what are the basic differences between sponsored recommendations and organic recommendations. So, uh, in order to do this exercise, we had to do a massive data collection. So, the data collection actually uh, comprise of, uh, you know, crawling the Amazon website. Um, and as I told you that uh, Amazon produces private level products and uh, we needed some categories where Amazon has uh, different private level, level products. And uh, um, uh, so uh, that those categories also should be you know, very generic. It should not be very, very specific, like say a very small cosmetic brand or something like that. Something that is very generic in nature and at the same time, something that has Amazon products, that is private level products. So uh, we came up with two such categories. One is the backpack category. So backpack category has uh, Amazon private level products, like as you see here, Amazon Basics. So this is an Amazon uh, private product. And as you see, there is an Amazon logo also here. And along with that, uh, it has um, uh, in this category, there are bags from other um, uh, uh, companies also, other sellers also. But this particular set of backpacks, which are uh, 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 manufactured by Amazon itself, are in direct competition with those other um, sellers. So backpack is one such category, which is pretty generic. And as I said that there is this producer brand and then there is this seller and fulfillment details. So this is actually fulfilled by Amazon itself because it's its own private level product. And the other category that we chose is the battery category. Again, this is a very generic category and um, it has again Amazon basics uh, products like the one that you see here. It has Amazon logos like this, okay? And there are other products, uh, 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 sorry, other um, uh, products from other sellers also in this category with which the Amazon basic products are in direct competition. So uh, this is a little bit of uh, more details about uh, the data. So, there seems to be a noise. Yeah. So it's difficult to continue with the noise. It is very difficult to continue with the noise at the background. Thank you. OK, so this is a little bit more details about the data. So we use a, a standard breadth first search crawler. And we start uh, crawling using a set of seed products initially and the recommendations and the metadata uh, associated with it are collected. So in the backpack category, we collected 10,775 items, whereas in the battery, battery category, we collected around uh, 5,300 items. So uh, both the organic and the sponsored recommendations, if you recall, are collected. So these are sponsored products and these are organic products. So both these recommendation lists are connect, collected during the crawl. So uh, a few important statistics, like only 1.5% of the total number of uh, backpack products are private label products, a very small number. So out of 1,245 distinct sellers, 62% availed fulfilled by Amazon facility. So all their, you know, uh, travel logistics is handled by Amazon itself. Cloudtel India is the seller having the largest number of products, backpack products. So as I said, that Cloudtel India is actually a subsidiary of Amazon. 
and 19.8 percent of the products were sold by Amazon affiliates, either Cloudtel India or Aperio Retail. Similarly, for the battery category, there are only 17 private level products out of 5,300 uh, products in the battery category, uh, and uh, 1,068 distinct sellers are there, with 46 percent of whom actually availed fulfilled by Amazon um, uh, facility. Cloudtel India again is the uh, seller having the largest number of products, and 7% of the products were sold by the Amazon affiliates like Cloudtel and Aperio. Now, then the question comes is as I started off with, how to compare the extent of bias toward a special group of items in sponsored recommendation model relative to the organic model? Okay, so in order to do this, we need to first, you know, conceive a model. So how do we conceive a model? So what we do is we construct something called a related item network. Now, this is a very important uh, concept that I'll uh, talk about, and we will be using this concept all through our analysis. So let us say that there are three items, A, B, C. Now, uh, for the item A, the things that are recommended on the page of item A are say B, C and D. Things that are recommended are in the page of item B are say E, C and F. And things that are recommended in the page of item C are say D, E and F. So from this table on the left hand side, we construct a directed network like this. Okay, so the network shows that each node here is an item, okay, and a directed edge tells that there is a recommendation going from node B to node C. If there is a directed edge from node B to node C, then this means that there is a recommendation link going from node B to node C. In this way, you construct something called the related item network. Why related item? Because the underlying assumption of any recommendation algorithm is that the items B and C should be somehow related. So, uh, for instance, if it is a backpack, I'm not going to, you know, recommend a battery for a backpack. So, if it is a backpack, I'm going to recommend some other type of backpacks maybe. So, that's why there is this uh, term related item. And if uh, on the item page of B, there is a recommendation to C, we draw an edge, a directed edge like this uh, from B to C. And in this way, the network gets constructed. So the uh, left-hand side table, when you uh, construct the uh, corresponding related item network, it will look like the right-hand side graph. So uh, the networks have different types of, you know, uh, such networks can be uh, studied using different types of metrics like degree distribution, com degree uh, in degree of the different types of items, relative ra related rankings, core periphery analysis, reciprocity analysis. For the sake of uh, uh, time, I'll be only talking about the in degree. So basically, uh, just to give uh, a brief idea of what is in degree, I guess all of you are aware. So here, in degree means the number of edges, directed edges that are incident on a particular node. That is, in this case, for the node C, there are two directed edges that are incident on C, and therefore the in degree of C is 2. Similarly, the in degree of E is 2, the in degree of uh, B is 1 the in degree of f is 2 and so on and so forth. Now, say if some node has a large in degree, what does it mean? Say some node has an in degree 10, some node has an in degree 30. So it means that many, many items are recommending that item. Okay. So if you go back to the recommendation table, you would immediately be able to infer that if some node has a high in degree, it means that many other items are recommending that particular item on their page. Okay. So these are some of the 
interesting properties that we have observed when we compare the uh, in degrees okay of the organic recommendation um, yeah, sorry organic organic related item network and the sponsored re related item network so you remember that we crawled the organic recommendation separately and the sponsored recommendation separately right so now uh, given this organic recommendations we can construct an organic recommendation network which we will call the organic ring and we can similarly construct construct a sponsored related item network which we'll call the sponsored ring right and uh, we are showing the results for the battery category the same results are also observed for the uh, backpack category so some of the interesting observations is that let us look at the in degree of the private label products so as i said that there are 17 private label products in the battery category right in the battery category the, there are only 17 private level products but you see this these 17 private level products their in degree is 520 in the sponsored ring whereas the average degree of any node is 11 they are sponsored uh, so, sorry they are the, in the sponsored um, uh, ring the uh, in degree of the um, uh, uh, private level products is 520 which is like 500 times larger than any item than any individual item randomly chosen in that network so that means to this uh, private level products these 17 products many other items on uh, the amazon marketplace uh, many other items actually recommend these private level products so although they are 17 very small in number many many other products are recommending these 17 products you see that's why their um, in degree is so high so anytime as if anytime you search any item any battery item you are going to see one or more of the amazon basic battery item in the recommendation list so this is a clear sign of clear initial sign of you know discrimination or unfairness in the system this is also true in the organic ring it's um, 46 but here it is just four times in the sponsored ring it's, it's a 500 times okay so uh, for the third party products which are not uh, private level products in the organic ring it is 11 which is also equal to the average in degree Whereas in the sponsored ring, it's very, very low. It's nine. Okay. So uh, similarly, for the um, Amazon affiliated sellers like Cloudtail Apario, okay, these uh, in degrees are very, very high. So it is 61 for the sponsored ring and it is 18 for the organic ring. So 61, as you understand, is again a very large number, okay, compared to 11. Whereas the uh, average in degree of the products that are sold by merchants on their own these are not amazon affiliates they use their own um, uh, logistics to you know transfer materials for them the in degree is just 5 so there is a huge disparity between 61 and 5 so this is what i want to um, actually highlight in this slide and all these results that you see here are statistically significant. So the next question is how to quantify the exposure induced due to different RINs. So uh, we have the sponsored RIN and we have the uh, organic RIN. Can we somehow quantify the exposure induced due to the different RINs? So for this, what we do is we use the popular random surfer model. So basically, what it does is that as if you are standing on some item and you are randomly jumping on another item following one of its edges. So if I go back in that network example, suppose I am randomly standing on node C, I will now have to decide whether I, I can jump on uh, some other node which are neighbors of C. So here we see two neighbors, E and D, and I can jump with equal probability 
on E or D. So the probability of jumping on E is half. The probability of jumping on D is uh, another half. So suppose if D, if C had in degree three, then the probability of jumping to each of them would be one by three. So this is what is the random surfer model. And you keep on jumping from one node to the other uh, multiple times. So what will happen? So if some node has a very high in degree, you will keep on coming back to that node many, many times. Okay. So this is as if simulating the way, you know, people are searching items and following the recommendation links. So this random surfer model is kind of a simulation of the surfing of the uh, recommendation items on the e-commerce platform. That's why we chose the uh, random surfer model. So uh, once uh, you, uh, you know, conduct this random surfing for a quite a long time, you find out the visit frequency. That is how many times a particular node has been visited by the random surfer. So if some node has a very high in degree, that means many other items are recommending that item, then that will have a, that node will have a high visit frequency compared to some other node which has a uh, low in degree and therefore uh, will have a low visit frequency. Okay. So uh, we do this uh, um, random surfing on both the organic ring as well as the sponsored ring. So we call the exposure um, in the um, organic ring as the organic exposure and it is denoted by EO. Similarly, we call the sponsored exposure as the exposure on the sponsored uh, recommendation, uh, so sponsored related item network or the sponsored ring. And this is uh, termed as or denoted as ES. Now the exposure bias, that is how different the organic exposure is from the um, sponsored exposure is defined by the KL distance. The um, this is a standard uh, distance that uh, uh, you will find in the uh, information retrieval literature. So this finds a distance metric between the um, between two distributions. So we find the KL distance between the exposure of ES exposure ES and exposure EO. That is the exposure given by the uh, organic rain and the exposure given by the sponsored rain to the different items. So these visit frequencies that you have seen in the last uh, slide, this forms the exposure, exposure distribution. So EO is the distribution of visit frequencies on the um, organic ring. Similarly, ES is the uh, distribution of the visit frequencies on the sponsored ring and you find the distance between the two distributions using the KL divergence or the KL distance. And this forms the metric for exposure bias. So now we will study that whether there is some distortion in the exposure, exposure for the sponsored recommendations, okay? How the sponsored rain is different in exposing certain items or certain sellers compared to the organic rain. Let's see. So again, we will look into the results for the battery category, but the same results also hold for the um, backpack category. So as you see, there are some very interesting observations that we can make here. So on the uh, x-axis, we write down the names of the different products, okay? And on the y-axis, we write down the exposure values, okay? This is the KL divergence that we have measured. And what do you see? You see that there are two brands that are largest, that are getting the largest exposure. And the largest among this brand in the sponsored ring is Amazon itself. So Amazon is giving itself the largest exposure in the 
sponsored rain. In the organic rain, also it is giving larger exposure to itself, but Duracell has a larger, even larger exposure than Amazon in the organic rain. So that's why you understand, right? So people probably tend to prefer Duracell more than the Amazon. And therefore, in the organic rain, since it's based on the people's choice, that's why this is featuring as the most exposed brand. Whereas in the sponsored rain, it's always or it's almost always that the, uh, the, uh, pro the private uh, product, the private uh, Amazon um, battery is getting the largest exposure. And actually, the 17 pro private label products that we talked about in the very beginning, they account for 25% of the total exposure in the sponsored ring. Similarly, if you look at the different brands, so the top brands are Power One, Panasonic, and Amazon. So once again, you see that Amazon is the largest brand. So Amazon is the largest product, Amazon is the largest brand. And in this particular uh, uh, result, it is more striking because 75% of the brands were underexposed. Okay, so they were, they did not get their deserved exposure. So similarly, for the sellers, so you see the two most important sellers are Cloudtel India and um, uh, Aperio Retail. So these are the uh, Amazon affiliates, as I told you, and they are subsidiaries of Amazon itself. Um, uh, and uh, actually, Amazon shares uh, are large volume of company share with them. So these two are the most important or the most highly exposed sellers on the sponsored rain as well as in the organic rain. So even in the organic rain, they are coming out to be some of the highly sponsored, sorry, highly uh, exposed um, sellers. However, for the sponsored dreams, the numbers are too, too high, while all the others are severely underexposed. So you see like any other uh, seller is not even in competition. So that is, uh, I mean, seems like that is a very unfair uh, dynamics that is going on there. So uh, it's it's like, uh, uh, so so there is one point of disclaimer here. Although we are talking about all this unfairness and discrimination, this might be, uh, you know, uh, unintentional. This might happen uh, without even the knowledge of the Amazon engineering, uh, that is the uh, A9 company at the back, uh, which actually does all the engineering stuff. Um, uh, it might, they might not be uh, aware of these results. However, like even uh, if they are unaware, unaware, we thought that a quantification or an auditing of the system is required to understand whether some sort of, you know, discrimination, some sort of bias is going on in the system. And this tells us, these results clearly gives us a quantitative evidence that there is strong signatures of bias present in especially the sponsored rings. So I would end with this note that we observe that Amazon affiliates and Amazon private level brands seem to be, you know, exorbitantly overexposed in the sponsored rain as compared to the organic rain. Sponsored rain, it's like hugely overexposed, com uh, com thus compromising the exposure of uh, the um, uh, uh, the um, um, other sellers or other products. Whereas in the organic rain, we also see signatures of discrimination, but to a much lesser extent. So I would stop here and would love to take questions.
if anybody has any question Questions are not coming in the chat box. So, uh, so would you end your session? Because uh, I think, will you go for any other topics? So uh, I uh, thought uh, uh, this was the uh, declared, uh, uh, you know, um, this was the declared uh, topic i can show the results for the battery category if people are interested um, so you can show because uh, you have time if you want to show you can show or uh, if people are interested to listen to some other works of mine which we are doing on head speech some sure, interesting sir. sure uh, sorry. so uh, if the if the organizers are interested then uh, we can do that but uh, uh, you have to give me a five minutes break and then we can start. Okay, I'll just let you know. Yeah. Okay, sir, no problem. Okay, so uh, let's uh, assemble back okay. uh, in five minutes. I'll, I'll get my slides prepared. Okay, sir. Sir, your screen is shared, sir. Yes, I will stop sharing.
I'm ready. We can start if if the audience is ready. Yes, sir. You can uh, start. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. OK. OK, so uh, since uh, like it seems like I have some more time left, so uh, I can discuss a little bit about uh, our uh, another research agenda. Uh, so all these are around um, the same theme, like fairness, justice, um, uh, and uh, governance of content in social media. So one area which we have been actively working for last few years is uh, analyzing hate content over social media. I guess uh, this again, this problem again, does not need uh, any introduction. Um, however, before I proceed, 
uh, I just want to make a disclaimer that this presentation might contain certain offensive words. However, uh, due to the nature of the presentation uh, or the nature of the work, uh, it's very difficult to avoid those. Uh, they have been suitably obfuscated uh, wherever uh, appropriate. Uh, but I request the audience to bear with me. So I guess uh, social media is now, you know, uh, omnipresent, like uh, there is uh, uh, social media for almost everything. Like there is social media for sharing news, there is social media for making friends, there is social media for posting pictures and uh, whatnot. So uh, of late people, uh, many, I mean, a majority of the population actually rates social media as one of the primary sources of news that they consume, okay? And uh, this therefore has led to many negative consequences. Although social media has a lot of positive sides, there are uh, many good things that could have been uh, done using social media and that are also in fact being done in social media. However, uh, every good thing has negative consequences as we understand like uh, even the uh, uh, like atom uh, bomb which was like the the i know I, I guess all of you are aware that the physics and the chemistry behind it was um, like discovered for a different purpose however it uh, got transformed into a bomb uh, which started uh, like all this uh, w devastations during the world wars. Uh, so similarly, uh, there are quite a few negative consequences of uh, social media and some of the primary ones are increased polarization, uh, abuse uh, against each other and against communities and hate speech in particular, about which I'm going to talk a little bit about in this uh, slides. So uh, like some of the negative consequences that have been, you know, attributed to hate speech are uh, listed below. Uh, some of the striking ones are the Rohingya genocide, the Pittsburgh shooting, the Sri Lanka riots, etc. And you can name many such. And it's not a single platform that is culprit. Like uh, uh, you find uh, hate speech across all different platforms, starting from Twitter, uh, WhatsApp, and certain new social media platforms, which have been, you know, conceived uh, in order to spread uh, hate. So uh, this is one platform that I'm going to talk in a little more details in the next few, few slides. This is called Gab. And uh, the post that you uh, see here is from Robert Boers, uh, I guess many of you uh, recollect uh, this person's name. Uh, he was the prime convict uh, for the Pittsburgh shooting. And this was the last post that he made on Gab before which, uh, after which he went uh, and did the shooting. So if uh, we were monitoring uh, the platform, then probably, I mean, well ahead of time, then probably we could have, you know, uh, stopped that prevented the disaster. So this work actually uh, is a contribution from uh, three PhD students. So this is one of the uh, largest areas in which uh, my efforts goes in these days. Uh, so there are three PhD students working on it, on it, Bini, Punnojoy and Mithun. And with myself, there is another colleague, Professor Pavan Goel from our department, uh, who are actively working on this area. So uh, in today's talk, I'll be probably uh, able to cover only the first topic, uh, the spread of hate speech, which was published in ACM website in 2019. Uh, so there are many other works uh, that uh, we have been doing as follow-up. And if you are interested, you can uh, look into my website. Uh, the details of all of these uh, are presented there. Uh, so uh, this work is, uh, uh, you know, uh, trying to study uh, how hate speech spreads in online social media. Okay, 
So this paper was published in ACM 2019 and uh, it was adjudged as the best paper honorable mention in the conference. So this work is on the uh, platform Gab and this Gab is a special uh, social media platform which promotes itself as a champion of free speech. However, it has been criticized to be, you know, an echo chamber of alt-right users. Uh, so alt-right means who are, you know, middle right to far right uh, users. So uh, similar to Twitter, uh, it has um, uh, the content posting facility. Then uh, you can like a content, you can share a content, you can uh, repost a content. All the facilities are very, very similar to that of Twitter. And Gap promotes uh, that it is actually um, uh, a, a, you know, a window of free speech. However, under this guise, it actually uh, promotes a lot of hateful content. So uh, on Gab, pretty much everything, posting pretty much everything is allowed. So there is uh, very little moderation. While in Twitter and other such platforms, uh, if you post something offensive or hateful, uh, there is it's very likely that uh, uh, your post is going to be deleted. And in uh, more adverse uh, situations, your account might also get suspended. However, in Gab, none of these uh, uh, typically happen. Uh, and the platform is uh, pretty unmoderated in that sense. So we collected around 21 million posts from around 343,000 users. So as you understand, this is a large data. So the so-called, uh, you know, the big data uh, that we collected using the Gab API. And we have various information uh, like including the basic details of each user, like the username, etc., and wherever the profile information is there, like age, uh, gender, uh, and so on, and all posts from the user and the followers and the followings of the user. Okay. So all these. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, so uh, with this data set, we start our analysis. So this, this slide actually summarizes the entire workflow. Uh, and then I'll blow up each of the parts in the later slides. So first thing that we do is we create a seed set of hateful users who have made 10 or more hateful posts. From this, we construct a repost network. I'll tell what is it. Exactly. And then from there, we construct something called a belief network. Now we initialize the seed set of hateful users with score one and the rest with score zero. Then we run a very simple diffusion model on this belief network and update the beliefs of the users iteratively till some convergence points. Um, and then users who have a belief score between 0.75 and one, we call them hateful users. We arrive at around uh, 2,300 uh, such hateful users among 343,000 uh, uh, users. Uh, and uh, another uh, set of users uh, whose belief scores are between 0 and 0.25. We call them non-hateful users. They are around 58,800 uh, in number. So you see the hateful users is much less in number compared to the non-hateful users. And there is a large gap between the two ends. So one end is 0 0.75 to one, and the other end is, end is 0 to 0.25. The rest of the users lie between in between this range. And uh, for these users, uh, we don't have something conclusive. They are, so it's very difficult to say whether they are, whether they are you know, uh, hateful or non-hateful, and therefore we do not comment on them. And we study uh, this uh, subset of users, the 2290 plus 58803 users. Now blowing up each part separately. So how do we uh, obtain the seed set of hateful users? We do some lexicon-based filtering. So we construct a lexicon of some 45 very high precision keywords, which are indicative of hate. 
like kike, which is a racial slur against Jews, beach 12, which is a racial slur against black people, sorry, fat people, uh, Paki, which is a racial slur against Muslims, and so on and so forth. So uh, we have 45 such uh, high precision keywords. And in Gab, like if you uh, see a post containing one or more of these slurs, you are almost sure that this is a hateful post. And then we uh, shortlist all those users who have 10 plus such posts, okay, with one or more such keywords in them. So the, all those users form our seed set of users. So now we construct something called a repost network. So a repost network is as follows. So each circle, each node here is a user, okay? And the uh, ages indicate that how many posts the user C has posted that is indicated by the self loop. That is the user C in this case has posted 10 posts and the same user C has reposted five of the posts of user A, okay? So C has made 10 of its own posts and has reposted five of the posts made by A. Similarly, user A has posted 17 posts and has not reposted any post from the other two users. Similarly, for B, it has not done any post of its own, but has only reposted nine of the posts of user A. Okay. From this repost network, we construct something called a belief network. What is the belief network? Now we see like uh, for the node C, how many posts as a fraction of total number of posts that has been done by C itself. So the, in this case, you see 10 posts out of total number of posts that C have made, that is 10 plus 5, 15 posts. Out of that, 10 posts have been made by C individually. So the uh, fraction here indicates 10 by 15, whereas the fact fraction here indicates 5 by 15. So this is kind of indicating the extent of belief that C has on itself and that C has on the user A. So and now you see from the repost network, we have converted the network into a belief network where the ages have also got inverted. OK, so it is as if that C has a 0.33 belief on A and 0.67 belief on itself. B has 0.75 belief on A and 0.25 belief on itself. And A has complete belief on itself only. So this is how you read the belief network. Now, once you have constructed the belief network, we actually run a belief propagation model. In this case, we have used a root model. It's a very, very simple model. So let's say uh, using the initial set of hateful keywords, we have already identified A to be a hateful user, OK? So among the hateful users that were in our initial set set, let A be one of the users. So A score is set to 1, as I have told earlier. Now we run a belief propagation algorithm. That is, we find out the score of the belief score of C at time point I plus 1 as 0 0.33 into the belief score of A at time point um, I plus 0 0.67 into a belief score of C at time point I. So these are the belief weights, OK? And in this case, uh, in the first time point, when I is 0, B A is 1, and B I C is 0, right? Because we don't have any belief uh, score here, whereas we have a belief score of 1 here. So then the belief score at I plus 1 becomes 0 0.33. And in this way, you keep on computing the belief score over and over again. And after a point in time, what we observe is that the belief scores do not change or change very, very, very little. OK, so at that point, we stop further computation. And so this is the point that we call the convergence point. And at this point, 
the nodes which have score of 0.75 to 1 are uh, typically termed as the hateful users or kh which means known hateful and the nodes with scores 0 to 0.25 are called nh or the non hateful users okay so now question is like after we have done this exercise we have to understand right like how good our um, identification has been so we actually ask two annotators and give them some 100 uh, users that we have annotated using our method that we have actually uh, identified using our method and ask them to find out whether our predictions from the model are correct or not so the annotator one finds 86.9% agreement okay for the hateful uh, user prediction and 92.2% agreement for the non hateful user prediction also the annotator 2 finds 93.2 and 99.4 respectively so there is a high agreement between what the annotator has is predicting or what the annotator is judging and the model is predicting and the uh, agreement between the in between the two annotators is also pretty high which is denoted by the kappa value so further evident evidences so we try to see you know what are the uh, topics specific topics in which the hateful users that we have identified actually post their content so there are various topics that are listed in gap and some of the topics there were the hateful users uh, actually post their content are like jews are the synagogue of satan the black race sucks so these the names themselves indicate that they are hateful topics and it seems that most of the hateful users that we have identified actually uh, post in uh, hateful topics whereas uh, for uh, users whom we have identified as non hateful they typically do not post in such hateful topics same is the uh, in the type type of urls shared so the hateful users share domains that many of which are extreme right okay uh, like end cultural marxism etc some of the names itself themselves are uh, you know very revealing so these kind of domains are being shared by the hateful users in their posts so this gives us a lot of evidence that whatever prediction we have done are uh, quite authentic and we can progress with the further analysis now in order to study how far the uh, messages of these hateful users spread in the network we study something called cascades so cascades are paths traced by a post as it is reposted by other users so suppose a user posts something then you look at the path traced by the other users who are posting this post so now it is very difficult to actually trace the influence path we uh, leverage the social connections between us users to identify this path and we employ something called the lrif or the least recent influencer model to create a dag to trace the path i'll come to this in the next slide so let's say we again have a network like this so a b c d e r the different users and let's say the posting time of a particular post is given by the number written beside the node so a posts the uh, original post at time 0 b posts it at time 100 c posts it at time 300 d posts it at time 500 and e posts it at for time 400 now uh, the edges that you see here are the followership links okay so c is able to see the post of a and b because c follows both a and b okay now the question is uh, a has posted the post at time 0 and b has posted the same post at time 100 now the question is from whom did c get the message it is following both a and b so there is a confusion so this is a confounding factor like from whom do we assume that she c has got the message in other terms who has influenced c is it a or is it b 
So we have to disambiguate. Now there are various disambiguation algorithms, two of which are very popular. One is the LRIF, that is the least recent influencer, which means the person who has posted earlier. Okay. So here, since A has posted earlier than B, we will assume that A is the influencer of C. The other one is the most recent influencer where B would be considered as the influencer of C. So we have taken both of them and we have seen that the results don't vary much. However, for the uh, sake of simplicity, here we will present only the results for uh, the least recent influencer model. So once you have uh, identified who are your least recent influencers, from this graph, now you have a DAG, which is not nothing but a cascade tree. Like, like this is the uh, way the message has flowed. That is how you can, uh, you know, imagine. Like A has posted, C has seen the message, C has posted, and E has seen the message. So this is how the message is getting cascaded in the network or flowing in the network. So now we study the cascades generated by the posts of the hateful users and compare it with the cascades generated by the posts uh, gener cascades generated by the posts of the non hateful users now we study various different cascades pro cascade properties so these are standard properties now as you see this is a dag you can measure different things like the number of unique nodes in the dag that is the number of users um, which is also called the size of the cascade the depth that is the length of the largest path in the, the cascade okay that you can easily find out since it's a dag you can always find out the largest path the average depth that is the um, depth of each path from the root node the breadth that is you know how much the cascade has spread at any level okay and the structural virality which is like the average pairwise distance between any pair of nodes okay so all these measures you can study and each of them kind of indicate how the cascade has spread in the network. Okay. Now, uh, we studied the cascades in, with respect to three different uh, types of posts. The original posts made by the uh, hateful and non-hateful users, the post that contains attachments like uh, media files or images, and the posts that contain to different topics. I showed you earlier that posts can be made to different topics. So first, if we look at the plain textual posts, we observe that the cascade size, depth, breadth, average depth, structural virality, all are larger for the hateful users compared to the non-hateful users. And all these results are actually statistically significant. Uh, so we did a statistical significance using this test using the Kolmogorov Smarnov test. So uh, we observe that all of these uh, are larger for the um, hateful group compared to the non-hateful group. And this, uh, so so this is uh, in a nutshell the uh, summary of the results. Posts of hateful users have a larger audience. They spread wider, deeper, and are more viral in nature. So um, the second is like if the post has some attachments like media files or images, here we see that the differences are getting only more pronounced. Okay, So it is that the gap between the hateful and the non-hateful users is only larger here. And same is the case for the topics. So this kind of shows us that if things get unmoderated things remain unmoderated in a platform as in gab then uh, it might be very detrimental because then the flow of hate speech actually is accelerated so every time a new hate post is made it accelerates very fast uh, in both breadth and width and depth uh, in the network and therefore there are uh, there should be certain moderation techniques that should be in place in order to you know contain the uh, spread of such um, vicious content so i'd stop here and would like to take questions now thank you so there is one there question is one, 
question in chat box that how you how have collected uh, data set yeah so as i so which data is this the first talk of the first data or the second data uh, i i think the second second session which you have taken section second lecture okay second that, lecture like as i said so the gab website provides an api so we used the api to collect the data so there is a standard api which the gab uh, uh, gab uh, uh, website provides us um and we used that in order to uh, collect the data so if you search using the term gab api i'm typing it in the chat box uh, on google you should be able to find out the data is also public so uh, if you write to us we can share the data with you this data is public hello yes hello sir uh, i i have a question that mm. uh, you mentioned that uh, some 40 or 45 uh, initial uh, hateful words uh, you have uh, fixed initially mm. so um, so, uh, so somehow i mean is it possible i mean is there may be that uh, few new form of uh, new form of um, hateful words are coming Uh, either new words or the representations are some sometimes different means either using taboo morpheme like star 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 or it may be letters are bungled or there are so many ways these hateful uh, words are uh, represented in the media so if i and not only that not only this 40 or 45 uh, hateful words there may be uh, so many more so is there any i mean if we fix on this 40 or 45 uh, hateful words if i uh, fix here so uh, i mean wh what do you think that is there any uh, impact on new type of negative words or something i mean am i i mean my, am i am i my question clear yes yes the question is very clear and it's a very uh, interesting question so uh, there are two aspects of it the first aspect is that note that we are uh, studying or we can, we are doing this analysis on the gap platform in the gap platform since the content is not moderated you don't need to obfuscate keywords okay hateful keywords you really absolutely don't need to obfuscate so anything hateful you are very very sure that gab is not going to put it down okay so uh, uh, so this the first part of the answer concerns the gab platform the uh, second part is that like whether new uh, hateful keywords are coming up or not agreed they are coming up and uh, uh, if you look at other platforms like twitter or reddit where the content moderation policies are very very strict even obfuscating does not help so if you even if you obfuscate uh, certain characters uh, from the hateful words that also does not help twitter has tricky algorithms to catch it so what people are doing is they are inventing hate codes for instance they are inventing codes for uh, blacks jews uh, muslims uh, and these codes could be skype microsoft google so each of these have an interpretation which only the community understands okay so uh, uh, something like all the microsoft should be killed okay so they would say something like this so which is like a hate code and it is very very difficult to identify such codes so uh, there is there are separate initiatives that are going on even in our lab uh, through which we are trying to actually identify such hate codes however for the gap platform this is not much uh, relevant because it's like a free platform the second thing is we were very much aware that there might be certain things that we are missing that's why we uh, said that these are our initial seed words and we started off with this initial seed words and we ran this diffusion algorithm why did we run this diffusion algorithm we could have stopped at you know uh, considering only those users who have posted one or more of these hateful keywords we did not do that 
we also wanted to get an idea of the users that surround these users imagining that those users might also be uh, sharing or reposting these ideas so they might not be directly using these keywords but but similar they might kind of be, mentality yeah they might have a similar mentality or they might be following them so if you are following continuously a hateful user and if you are reposting uh, the hateful content posted by that user then uh, the uh, so it, uh, uh, a natural conclusion would be that you know that person is also hateful but probably not proactive that person is just reactive so that's why we uh, you know did this diffusion model to collect more evidence okay sir thank you thank you so there is another question on chat box is uh, so by antara pal so uh, language, language yes i see i see the question language means uh, programming language you mean to say see you can use pro any programming language but i think our students mostly use because these are uh, mostly uh, nlp related stuff so our students mostly use python I think there are no more questions coming, so okay. we can. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, uh, for delivering such a informative speech. And so we will end here. Thank okay. you once again, sir. Thank you. And for the Thanks, participants, sir. we will just come back uh, at two p.m. for the next session.
Halo. Halo. Halo, Sir. Ha. Saya sudah sampai, Sir. Sir, change code, Sir. Ha, sudah. Yes, Sir. আমি কিছু মানে ভিডিও বা কিছু দেখতে পাচ্ছি না আপনার দিকে আমারটা আসছে তো আমারটা আমারটা দেখতে পাওয়া যাচ্ছে তো আচ্ছা আমি অন করেছি এবার আচ্ছা আচ্ছা আমাকে দেখতে পাচ্ছেন তো হ্যাঁ স্যার ভিডিও আসছে একটা হেজি আসছে কোনো কারণে সে আর ইন কি করব আপনারটা একটা হেজি আছে এখন ইন্টারনেট কানেকশন দেখুন হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ এখন চলে ঠিক আছে হ্যাঁ আচ্ছা এই মাইক্রোসফট এটা দেখছিলাম যে পেছনটা একটু ব্লার করা যায় मैं So are they already online? No, they are yeah, they are going. Just uh, join question. My join question is that. No, basically, no. I am only one month. My point is just now. Okay. The video quality is very bad. Our video is very bad. Our screen is very bad. Our video is very bad. I don't know uh, whether it is a problem here or because uh, yesterday it was very good. I mean, for a few days, we tested it. Deepak, da. অপরবা নেটের কানেকশন নেটের কানেকশন জানো আমি শেয়ার করছি স্লাইডটা দেখুন স্লাইডটা ঠিকঠাক আসছে না স্লাইডটাই মোর ইম্পর্টেন্ট আর কি হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ ঠিকই আছে জাস্ট ভিডিও কোয়ালিটি ওকে অপরবা না না ভিডিও তো এখন শুধু সাথে দেখা যাচ্ছে ভিডিও দেখলে বলে যাবে আমাদের ঠিক আছে আচ্ছা আমার ভিডিওটা বন্ধ হয়ে গেল কেন ইউ ক্যান শেয়ার ইওর ভিডিও when you are done with screen sharing আচ্ছা এখানে বলছে যে আমি ভিডিও তখনই শেয়ার করতে হবে যখন স্ক্রিন শেয়ার বন্ধ হবে রাইট কোনো অসুবিধা নেই স্যার কোনো অসুবিধা নেই আচ্ছা 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 স্যার পিপিটি ভালো আছে পিপিটি নিয়ে কোনো সমস্যা নেই একদম পরিষ্কার পিপিটি একদম ঠিক আছে স্যার পিপিটি আছে তো ঠিকঠাক হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ এবার বন্ধ হলে তখন আবার ভিডিও শেয়ার হবে আচ্ছা বেসিকটা মানে সিএনএন বললে কি বুঝতে পারবেন তাই তো মানে ইফেক্ট হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ মোটামুটি তো স্টাইলি আপনি স্যার একটু বলতে পারেন 5 দশ মিনিট কিছু ব্যাপার নেই আপনি একটু টাচ করে যেতে পারেন হ্যাঁ সেটাই আমি জিজ্ঞেস করছি না আপনি টাচ করে যেতে পারেন কোনো অসুবিধা নেই 
মানে সেরকম ভাবে সিএনএন নিয়ে কোনো টপিক আলোচনা হয়নি আমি যেটা বলবো মাঝে ডিস্টর্ব করছে আপনার কথা কেটে কেটে যাচ্ছে নেটওয়ার্কে প্রবলেম আছে I think sir is ready so we can start i think sir yes yes good afternoon everybody so we have come to the day 4 second half session this session will be delivered by professor devashish sen he will be talking on the topic the evolution of uh, generative adversarial learning <coughs> Professor is an assistant professor in the Department of Electronics and Electrical Communication Engineering and a faculty in the Center of Excellence in Advanced Manufacturing Technology of Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. He received his PhD in image processing from Jadapur University, Kolkata and his MASc in electrical engineering from 
Concordia University, Montreal, Canada. He was a postdoctoral researcher at the Multimedia Analysis and Synthesis Laboratory, National University of Singapore, and at the Center for Soft Computing Research, Indian Statistical Institute. He currently heads the Vision, Image and Perception Research Group and the Art Eye Lab in his department, which are funded by multiple agencies of Government of India and prominent industries in India. His current research interests are in Vision, Image and Video Processing, as Uncertainty Handling, Eye Movement Analysis, Machine Vision and Deep Learning. Has authored uh, and co authored more than 50 research articles in high impact journals and conferences. Professor is on the editorial board of IET Image Processing, Springer Circuits, Systems and Signal Processing, and IEEE MMTC Communications Review. He has received a Young Scientist Award from the Institution of Engineers, India. Uh, Qualcomm Innovation Fellowship and ERCM Alien Bensosan Fellowship, a Ministry of Manpower at Singapore Research Fellowship, 